everyone who is here in this room with us today. I pray that as we dive into the book of Mark, we experience the Jesus that Mark himself and the disciples themselves were able to experience. Give us new insight and understanding into who you are. Soften our hearts to receive whatever it is you have for each of us today, God. We are grateful for this day. We are grateful for the gloomy change of spring season, God. We look forward to the flowers and the growth and the new that is about to come out of the earth, Lord. We are so grateful that you are a God of beauty who did design every element of nature for our enjoyment, God. And we just celebrate this day as that. And all together we proclaim... Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're here in person, I'm really excited that you're here in person. If you're online, that's okay too. It's not as exciting, but we're grateful that you're still joining us. We are in the book of Mark. If you have your Bible today, we're in Mark 2. We are slowly moving our way through. And if not, no problem. I have the verses here. We're starting in Mark Chapter 2, verse 18. Let's read that text together. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came to Jesus and they said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of untruck cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from the new from the old, and, the, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And if he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. New wine is for fresh wine skins. We pick up here immediately. Some commentators believe that this is still the same interaction that Pastor Ray preached on last week, where we had the conversion of Levi, the tax collector, who would then become Matthew, one of the disciples. They're, they are at a celebration. He's leaving the tax collector life behind. He's joining Jesus. They're at a party. They're feasting. They're together. And in the middle of this party, it says, someone asked. It could have been a Pharisee. It could have been a follower of a Pharisee, a scribe. But someone interjects while Jesus is at this party and says, hey, Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting too? And this question and these questions, you see Jesus in the middle of a series of collisions between himself and what he's doing and the current religious establishment. And as I'm reading this person, right, they lean in. I'm sure Jesus is at the table with his disciples and someone just kind of like leans in. And I can think of this kind of person, these people. Do you know any of these people who put it on themselves to keep everyone around them kind of like accountable and in check? Like it's their job and duty to make sure everyone's following the rules and everyone's doing it the way that they think. When I was in college, I worked at a lotion and body spray and candle place. And I was at the register and I remember this mom came in and she had these little girls and you could tell she, her hands were full. She had kids, she was shopping. And she handed me this coupon, and it was expired. But the place that I worked, we always had coupons. We had a pile of coupons right next to the register. So, you know, I just swapped it out. These aren't my candles. These aren't my coupons. Like, not a big deal to me. And I finish the transaction, and I look over, and my coworker is just, like, glaring me down. And I was like, you okay, Brenda? And she's like, her coupon was expired. And I was like, I'm aware, but I just gave her a new coupon, and it's not a big deal. And the rest of the night, Brenda, Brenda, she was like <laughs> putting stuff away on the shelves and would just like glare at me. And I was like, calm down, Brenda, these aren't your candles. Like, chill. But Brenda was not chill. And 
And in this same way, these people around Jesus were not chill. There was always these, like, judgy looks. There were always these questions in his direction. From particularly the Pharisees in this community. The Pharisees, as Pastor Ray went over a couple weeks ago, they were a section of Jewish tradition and religion who held themselves to very high standards. They were very strict in the way they act, in the way they worshiped, in the way that they celebrated, in the way that they fasted, in the way that they did communion. So much so that they were judgy and kind of righteously placed by themselves above everyone else, right? They were the Brenda out of the corner of the eye, kind of looking and seeing what everyone's doing all the time. But the problem with Jesus is that he was unlike any religious leader that they've ever experienced. The way that Jesus talked, the way that he interacted with people, the people he interacted with was so unlike Jewish tradition, was so unlike any priest or prophet or king or leader they've ever had that it made them uncomfortable. And when we are uncomfortable, like the Pharisees, we tend to get a little, I don't know, judgy. We tend to get a little uncomfortable. And we act that way. We're trying to protect ourselves. And that's all the Pharisees are doing, trying to protect their way of life and their thoughts and the way they've been operating. Why aren't your disciples fasting? Verse 18. Now John's disciples, oh, John, you remember him? He baptized you, right? His disciples are fasting. And the Pharisees, these men of God, their disciples are fasting, but Jesus... You're here doing ministry. Why aren't you and your disciples following the law? Why aren't you and your disciples following religion and custom like we all have to? There's a couple things we need to know about fasting as we dive into this. Biblically, Jews were only asked to fast once a year. And this was the Day of Atonement. This is the day when we would come fast with our sacrifices, to plead God for forgiveness and to hopefully move forward in this next year with like a clean slate. Then there were other flavors, other sections of Jewish religion that they had more fasting days. So you would also see some Jews, they would fast on historical days of tragedy within their culture. Like when King Solomon's temple was destroyed. We fast and we remember. We remember those days of old. But then there were people like the Pharisees who actually were fasting twice a week. And when we think of fasting right now, we think, well, they're just abstaining. Abstaining from food, maybe reading, reading the Torah, devoting themselves to God. But that's not what the Pharisees were actually doing. If a Pharisee was fasting, you would see them walking through the city with their faces painted white, with ash upon their head, with clothes that were completely destroyed, torn, and they would always be in public places. You would not miss them fasting. Their every hope and goal was that everyone around them would see how committed and devoted they were to Yahweh. And they, they, they achieved that. You can't not look, you can't not see that. They walk down the street, oh, those are the Pharisees. They must be really committed. They must be really devout. One commentator puts it this way. Barclay, he said, the fasting of the Pharisees was a ritual. And it was a self-displaying ritual at that. To be of any self, or excuse me, to be of any value, fasting must not be the result of a ritual. It must be the expression of a feeling in your heart. In Matthew 6, on the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus actually indirectly addresses this type of fasting that the Pharisees were doing. He said, it's Matthew 6, 16 through 18. He said, when you practice some appetite 
denying discipline to better concentration on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it will not make you a saint. If you go into it training inwardly, you need to act normal outwardly. Wash your face, comb your hair, and brush your teeth. God doesn't require attention-getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing. If your heart is right, he'll reward you well. So we have the Pharisees with their self-righteous fasting, asking Jesus, why aren't you doing it like us? And then Jesus answers, and you will see his answers through Mark and through all of the Gospels look very similar to this. He answers in what we call parables, metaphorical language. He uses stories to explain. What we need to remember about parables, or anytime you see Jesus using this kind of language, is it's really important to understand that the context and relevance of that parable, of that story, of that metaphor, are targeted towards the original listeners. That if you want the most out of any of the parables, any of the metaphors that Jesus uses in his teachings, you need to understand that his parables were always timely, that they were always purposely given for his present audience, and that having a cultural understanding of what is happening around Jesus as he teaches and preaches will give you the greatest understanding of what he's talking about. In a social rhetorical commentary on Mark, it stated, Jesus used parables, analogies, and metaphorical language to draw comparisons between God's dominion and early Jewish life. And he often used parables to, his, to discuss eschatological matters which challenge all conventional assumptions. When Jesus wants to talk about things that are really heavy, when Jesus wants to talk about stuff that's theologically based, when stuff that's about him as the Messiah, that's about the end times, about what God is doing. He often uses stories and parables to kind of soften the blow and to give it in a reachable and tangible way for the listeners. He looked at the Jews and he looked at these Pharisees or whoever asked this question and he said, I know what you believe. I understand your history. I understand where you've come from. I see what you've been doing. I understand what you think. And considering all of those things, here is truth. And in these three specific examples, he, he does a juxtaposition of two things. We're going to see the theme of new and old. And Jesus is doing this because he understands that the way that he lives, that the ways he is acting, that the people he's talking to doesn't make sense. That they genuinely look upon Jesus and cannot comprehend why is this man who's claiming to be God's chosen acting unlike a way we expected God's chosen to act. He's aware. So in his Jesus way, in the loving and nurturing and teaching way of Jesus, he's trying to bring understanding to people who don't understand him. And what's really especially lovely about Jesus and every interaction he has with people is he brings his truth and understanding right to where they are. Let me give you, you, you Pharisee, you scribe, whoever's asking these questions, let me give you something that you can handle right within context of who you are and where you are. Jesus always meets people where they are. Jesus met the woman at the well right where she was. He did not bid her to come to temple for a conversation. All of the miracles that we saw in Mark, he met people, these sick people. He did not say, okay, let's go 
to the infirmary together and I'll heal you there. He met them right where they were. And that is the way in the operation of Jesus. He's always going to meet us. He's always going to meet the people that we care about right where we are. And then as you grow and as you get deeper into your relationship with him, he will, get, he will grow and he will become deeper in his with yours. And there will always be more. And there will always be something else to learn. And there will always be greater understanding to be had. But God's always going to start right where you are. He answers this question. Why aren't your disciples fasting in three ways? He answers it first. Verse 19. He says, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And they will fast in those days. Context. If you know anything about Jewish culture, Jewish weddings, they do not have honeymoons. The bride and groom would not have left like we do now in our culture. They stay in their home, and the wedding is weeks of celebration with family and with loved ones and feast. A wedding and that new relationship and family was for, that was formed was of high honor for the Jews. Because again and again in Scripture, we saw God mirroring marriage to himself and the nation of Israel. And a way to celebrate that was to have great celebrations when people do become wedded. And those who were what we would call the wedding party, the closest to the bride and groom, they would be celebrating with the bride and groom for two to three weeks at their house, eating, drinking, being together. And according to Jewish law, if any time of fasting were to come up during that celebration, the bride, groom, and their wedding party are exempt. That they have a righteous exemption to continue celebration of this new creation because it's important. And so it's like they're asking Jesus, you're asking for fasting at a party where fasting is inappropriate. It doesn't make sense. It does not fit. In the next verse, he talks about new cloth. In verse 21, he says, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. And if he does, the patch tears away, the new from the old, and the, a worse tear is made. He's saying, you don't have an old piece of clothing, and you take a new, unwashed, unshrunk piece, and you mend it. Because if you then wash it, what will happen? The new will then shrink. It will rip, a, it will rip apart the old that cannot take the pressure. And then everything's destroyed. It doesn't make sense. He's getting to a point. It doesn't work. It will not fit that way. And he does it again. He says... Verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskin, and if he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. New wine is for new wineskins. In the fermentation process of wine, expansion occurs. So if you put wine into a fresh and unused wineskin, it will grow and it will stretch as the wine develops. If you put wine into an old, used, dried, and worn out skin, once it expands, the elasticity is gone and worn, it will explode. And the wine will be of no use. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. In that same commentary, Witherington says, in each case, the metaphor indicates that Jesus has initiated a new state of affairs. And that the old and the new cannot be mixed together. Jesus, his ministry has to do with the new, which requires new forms. Not a grafting of the new into an old form. The ministry of Jesus was literally the dominion of God breaking into human history. No longer was God residing above and separate from it. 
It's a breakthrough. It's a new break, a new connection into where humans were. Yet you want me to treat it like something old. Yet you want me to act like what I am doing and what he is saying is what everyone else has always done and what everyone else has always said. Here, Jesus, and over and over again, you're going to see he gently affirms himself as Messiah, as God's chosen in his sonship. He is not a prophet. He is not a priest. And he is, the prophets and the priests of old all went and lived and found their spot in the story of God. But Jesus was not a prophet or a priest. Jesus is the story of God. And he is the story of God, not just in the nation of Israel. Jesus is the story of God in the salvation of all mankind. There is no comparison between the two. Why do we need to fast and seek atonement from God? If God's atonement, if God's forgiveness, his love and power is dining at the table next to you. Why do you need to mend old clothing with new if God has placed fresh dressing robes in front of you? Why are you trying to force old wineskins to hold new wine when Jesus has not only provided new wine, but he has new skins? He has it all. Why are we trying to force the old things and the new things together? His point, it just doesn't make sense. Jesus isn't saying that the old should just be discarded. But what he is saying is what has now come far surpasses everything that went before. Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting? Jesus is the answer to their question. His presence changed everything. His presence is the answer to that question. Why aren't they fasting? I am. Why aren't they doing things the way we've all done them? And later they're going to they're going to attack him again. Why don't they do Sabbath? Why are they working? I am. I'm here now in a way that you've never had before. I am here now in a way that you were never able to experience before. So do not expect my disciples to operate in the way that yours did. He's not John the Baptist. He's not any of the ancient prophets. He's Jesus. His presence changed absolutely everything. A couple of weeks ago, and as I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about this moment. I was playing with our son, Racer, and he loves Legos. And he just has bins and bins of them. And we were playing, and we were playing this game where we were finding Weird heads to mix with weird bodies, right? Like Little Bo Peep and Thanos on a skateboard. And I found this really cool, really weird goat head. And it, but it was on the goat body. And for the life of me, I could not get the goat head off of the goat body. Like, it would not twist. It would not loose. They even have these little tools, if you're familiar with Legos, to like pop Legos off. And it wouldn't come off. And I'm not an obsessive person, but my son is a little judgy and mean, so I was going to get those <laughs> Legos to work. And so I could not get it off for the life of me. And Racer's just sitting there watching me. And finally he goes, Mom, that's not a Lego. That's a Plago. And I was like, what the heck is a Plago? And he's like, oh, I got those from grandma, she got them at the dollar store. And I was like, oh, well, of course, Lego and Palego are not gonna be compatible. So we finally, I finally like got it off. And I was like, no, Racer, you're wrong. It's gonna work. And I put it on the Lego and it just like twisted off and fell. And I was just, I was just like, ah! But that Plego and Lego were never gonna fit together. 
It was never going to work. Our friend was never going to work with that primo Lego that I had. They're incompatible. And in the same way, Jesus was never going to fit into what the Pharisees wanted. He was never going to fit into their culture. He was never going to fit into their ideals of kingship. He was never going to fit into their plans, their hopes, their dreams. It's impossible. Regardless of what he did, his character, himself, his plan, his purpose was never going to fit into theirs. And in the same, Jesus will never fit into the purposes and the plans of this world either. There will be times when the goals of Jesus align with what's happening with our culture of peace. There will be times when justice and righteousness will align with that of Jesus, but it will always veer away. Jesus doesn't have a place in our world. And even you and I, in whatever season, whatever place you are of following Jesus, you are going to have struggles where Jesus does not fit. You are going to have plans and ideas and dreams where it doesn't make sense, where it doesn't line up, where you're trying to get Lego and Plego to come together. It's going to keep falling apart. The problem is with us, with this world that we are a part of, with the Pharisees thousands of years ago, is we all have a flawed and narrow perception of this world. We are rooted and grounded, regardless of how much we grow, we're still surrounded by sin. It's a part of who we are, and because of that, we're always going to have biased attentions. We're always going to have misinterpretations. We're always going to have dreams or hopes that just don't seem to go along with where Jesus is going. Jesus did not come to fit into this world. He did not come to fit into the mold that Jewish society had built for him as a king. He did not come to fit into the mold you have of God. Jesus came to create something new. And the beauty of Jesus, the beauty of the gospel, is that he will never fit into what we are doing, where we are going, what we are thinking. But the beauty is that he made a place for you and I to fit. That his divine plan was not to come and insert and find himself a space. His divine plan was to create something new in which we can all fit in with him. And the Pharisees were never going to see that. But here we are at the end of Mark, knowing Jesus came And he died and he resurrected and that place has been made. So I don't know what you've come in with today that's not fitting. Maybe it's something good. Maybe it's dreams and plans. Maybe it's hopes and desires. Maybe it's just broken pieces with disconnected, unmatching heads and bodies. He's saying, look, now's the time to take all the Legos, all the off-brands, all the Play-Go, and just dump them in the trash, because look, I've got new ones. My plan is a place for you to fit. No more need of fasting. No more missing the celebrations. No trying to fix the old and the new. No more busting wine containers. He is the answer. His presence is the answer. His purpose is the answer to everything. Will you guys pray with me today?
Dear God, we want to believe and we want to know this Jesus. The Jesus who came not as a threat to humanity, but as a salvation to humanity. Not looking to tear us apart and knock us down, but looking to pick us up from the brokenness we are already in. God, we do not want to be like the Pharisees. We do not want to be like the outlookers on the edge of the party who are just watching Jesus living in confusion and frustration. We may be uncomfortable and we may not understand what you are doing, but we know and we are confident that what you are doing and the place where we fit in your story is better than any story that we can ever create on our own. God, let us fall into your molds. Let us fall into your fit. And then that verse will become true where then you will give to us the desires of our hearts. You will hand to us what you have for us. You will hand to us what you want for us. Not the other way around. God, we are done giving you the molds we want you to fit into. Lord, convict us in the areas where we are trying to squeeze you. Lord, today, just bust those open. Let us throw away the Legos. Give us new ones, God. And just show everyone in this room, each individual person, where they fit in your grand and beautiful story of the salvation and the redemption of your creation of all mankind. God, let that go out with us today. Wherever we are, wherever we go, let it be with you and for you. And in your name we pray. Amen.